What you're watching here are nematode worms, highly magnified. These worms are only about one millimeter in length at their largest, and these are the tiny worms that we'll be working with this semester. So in the lab, you'll see these worms being cultured on petri dishes like this. So these petri dishes have a layer of agar gel that's nutrient rich, and on that we grow a thin layer of bacteria. And it's those bacterial cells that these tiny worms consume as they make their way through the agar. And as they consume those worms, they grow, and eventually they reach the age of sexual maturity. And you can imagine that because the worms are so small, we can keep hundreds on a petri dish like this so that we can keep many, many, many in our lab incubators. So Cinerobditis elegans is a model organism that we work with in our lab. And your textbook provides a definition of model organism in the glossary. It says, a particular species chosen for research into broad biological principles because it is representative of a larger group and usually easy to grow in lab. So what do you think might be some of the properties of a good model organism? If we think about it, it's going to be, again, as stated in the glossary, organisms that have some application to broader biological principles. So what if we wanted to learn maybe about disease resistance in corn? What kind of organism would we use to study that? What if we wanted to learn about genetic-based diseases in animals? What kind of organism might we use as a model organism? The second piece is that the organism should be relatively easy to maintain in the lab. And so we'll want to consider that in terms of size, how fussy they are in terms of what they have to be fed for their nutrition, and how about how long lived they are? How long is their generation time? When we study genetics, we definitely want multiple generations and lots of offspring to work with. So make yourself a little list of model organisms you may know about, and then we'll pick back up and see if you got some of the ones on my list. Well, hopefully you got a few ideas. If we were studying a plant, we might want a plant model. Now, corn can take a whole season to grow. We do get a lot of offspring, so we might use it as a model organism, but there are fast plants. Fast plants, Arabidopsis, it actually reaches sexual maturity. It goes from a germinating seed all the way to a mature reproductive adult in just 30 days. And so it makes an excellent model for genetic study. But if we're interested in animal disease, maybe we'd want to use an animal model, something small, easy to keep, easy to feed, something not dangerous. And in fact, there are lots of animal models out there. Maybe you remembered mouse. Mouse is an excellent animal model. Maybe you thought of fruit flies. Maybe you've worked with those before. And even though they're invertebrates, they share many genes with mammals like ourselves. And in fact, zebrafish is another model organism. It goes from a hatchling fish to a mature adult in about 30 days, and it can have many offspring because it lays eggs. And even chicks, chicken, is a model for animal genetics. Of course, our animal is the nematode worm, Cinerobditis elegans, and that's the one that you'll be learning a lot more about in lab. So don't forget to take a look in your lab manual to be ready to see what kinds of things we're going to learn about Cinerobditis elegans, the nematode worm. Start practicing your spelling so you can remember how to write the name, the scientific name of that organism. Notice the genus is always capitalized and the species never is, and it's always italicized. When you're writing by hand, you can underline instead. But be ready for lab, be ready to do some hands-on work, learning more about a model organism.